You're welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Let's uh, take a time travel to the year 2014 uh, to talk about this day in history, uh, the 27th of May 2014. Now, on this day in history, something not very um, sweet happened, and it's about the death of the Emir of Gombe. His name was Alhaji Shehu Abubakar. He died at the age of 76 on this day in history in a hospital in London and was flown back to Nigeria to be buried uh, on the grounds of the palace in Gombe State. Um, we know that Alhaji Shehu Abubakar was the 10th Emir of Gombe State and he played a very important role in the creation of Gombe State in 1966. Well, um, some records say actually he was the 11th Emmy of Gombe, so those figures really uh, are fuzzy right there, but he was on the throne for about 30 years, you know, when he passed on on this day in history in 2014. It was a very big story talking about how he contributed, you know, to the creation of Gombe State, all his efforts, you know, in nation building and all of that, but it was on this day in history that his life was, you know, celebrated nationally, you know, um, for his efforts in, you know, Nigeria and uh, moving the country forward. But we know that his son, um, Abubakar Shehu Abubakar, um, was appointed as the new emir after he died, you know, and that was in June 2014. All right. Um, so, you know, well, very briefly, you know, same thing, you know, with the story I'm sharing from 2009 in South Africa. Um, I'm just going to briefly say, you know, the, the, these stories, you know, when I see things like this, it really just makes me uh, feel bad, you know, about the cultures that we may have lost um, in the last few decades in Nigeria. Um, what, primary school, secondary school, you know, there's pictures, you know, that you would see of certain festivals, certain traditions in, you know, many parts of Nigeria, not just in Edo State now, in Gombe, in Katsina, in Yobe, Benue, you know, some, some uh, the Argungun Festival, I don't, I don't know if they still have it um, every year. But some of all those things just really, really used to make me feel good as a child, seeing those cultures. Um, but over time, migration... Security challenges, development, woke. you know, some of, some of all those things have made us lose some of all those cultures. And it just personally just makes me feel bad that there are certain things that you may not be able to fully and truly enjoy about Nigerian cultures in different parts of the country anymore. You cannot travel to Sokoto now and enjoy certain things that used to be there in the 80s. You will not travel to Abelkota now, you know, and see some of those um, Yoruba traditions and festivals that used to be there um, in the 80s. Um, and, you know, you can only read about these things in history books. And we don't even do well enough with our history um, in Nigeria. There's so much of it that, we, that is I, lost. I think one of the reasons, just one of the reasons, you know, so many reasons why this could be, but one of them, you can't take away the, the, the influence of Christianity on most of these things. You know, when we facts, you know, now you have lots of people, especially during colonization, you know, Christianity and all of that, they say these things are fetish, you know, these these things that were our culture rooted in us, things that our ancestors believed in, appreciated, you know, they say these things are fetish, you know, and we basically just ignore these things and, uh, you know, focus on modernization, Christianity. So now nobody does, you know, all these festivals, they say, oh, you're serving a particular God, you oh, know, but, is, but abroad, in other, in other parts of the world, you, okay, first of all, take take a look at this. They say our things are fetish. They tell us to abandon them, but they come and steal all our masks, steal all our all our you know beautiful well, artwork, and they put it in the museums, and they're charging lots of dollars for people to come watch them. So well, we there, we need to have that, a know. greater sense of appreciation for our art and our culture. Yeah. So so there is you know the you know the Christianity and modernization and you know religious aspects of it. You know, but I feel. You know, that even with all of that, you know, we, we still have been, we should have still done better with maintaining some of those, you know, um, 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 traditions. Um, some of them, of course, you know, outdated and should be kicked away, you know, but, um, you know, arts and culture, you know, there is, there is a ministry, I believe, that should be handling uh, some of all of that. The Ministry of Tourism, I don't know what exactly they do, but um, I just feel like we, we have lost a lot of it, you know, in the Southeast in Edo State, in the Southwest, in the, in the North, Middle Belt. There's so much of it that we've lost. 
NTA used to show the Aragongong Festival, you know, uh, way back then. And I used to really, really enjoy watching yeah, it. I remember. Um, seeing those very, very massive fishes that they used to catch. Um, but these days, uh, you know, it barely makes it to TV. I think one, one country that's still, you know, very vibrant when it comes to showcasing their culture is China. Because you need to just take a look at some Chinese TV, televisions yeah. that are free to air. And you need to see just how much they showcase their culture with pride. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move to South Africa now. In 2009, they entered their first recession on this day, uh, 27th of May in 2009. It was the first recession after appetite. Um, um, of course, as uh, the global crisis uh, pounded the demand for its main exports, leaving growth down 6.4% in its uh, first quarter. The market had expected a drop, but the show was far worse than most forecasts, according, of course, and adding new pressure on the president back then, Jacob Zuma. The economy had contracted 1.8% in the last quarter of 2008, and two consecutive quarterly contractions put South Africa in its first recession in 17 years. The main drags on the economy were manufacturing, which was down 3.3 percentage points, and mining down 1.7 uh, points, uh, percentage points. The government warned that South Africa would uh, likely also see another contraction in, in the second quarter before the economy began to recover in the uh, second half. Um, if, of course, for those who know, South Africa's economy depends uh, uh, mostly on uh, commodity exports, um, especially from its mines, where thousands of jobs have been um, you know, created and at the same time lost. The South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, president said the GDP report takes uh, one completely um, aback when the magnitude of the decline at that time was uh, considered. Um, and so, you know, after, you know, pretty successive and successful run after appetite, um, on this day in 2009 was the first time that South Africa um, experienced its first recession. Mm. Yeah, there was not, not very much to add to that, actually. Not very much what? Uh, to add to, you know, to that conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know like, like the stats say, manufacturing really suffered, as well as experts, you know. But yes, those were the facts of the case what happened this day in history in 2009. Absolutely. So let's uh, take a break here. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving into our first major conversation for today. Um, fintechs across Nigeria who, of course, in the last few years have seen very, very massive support and growth. There's some of them that are still being celebrated today. Some of them have become, you know, part of our daily lives and we can't do certain transactions without some of these uh, uh, fintechs um, across Nigeria. But the CBN, of course, has uh, stated new rules and uh, um, figures with which these fintechs can exist in Nigeria. And we'll get into that conversation right after this short break. Stay with us. <music> 